I am Topher Zimmerman, I'm the uh, product manager for uh, front end topics in general and currently focusing on light development. Uh, I've been at Magnolia for about four years and was a developer for three years and now have switched to product management. Uh, but yeah, my background is as a developer. Uh, I did some platform game development uh, back in the day. And then once the web was picking up, moved into that and have been uh, working at web agencies, uh, have done freelancing and have worked in startups. So uh, just a long background in web development. Thanks a lot, Topher. I'm Rasmus Skjölden. So I'm the team lead of the product management uh, team. And um, my past uh, in, in terms of CMSs uh, are with the Type 3 CMS and the NEOS project that spun out of the Type 3 community. And, um, and I've been with a lot of agencies, so I know the whole agency business extremely well. Um, and what is important to, to know about me is that I'm non-technical. I'm really not a developer of any kind and uh, don't understand too much about the uh, technical setups that we're working with. Uh, however, I come from the worlds of content strategy and UX and author experience uh, and kind of try to bring that perspective uh, into product management at Magnolia. So um, before we move into the actual topics, I would very much like uh, to say thank you to this guy. I don't know if he's here. Uh, Philip, are you here? No? All right, but could you please give him a hand because uh, he really deserves that. So I, I took over from, from Philip in the product management team and he is also the former CDO of, uh, of Magnolia, as many of you know. CTO, sorry, <laughs> absolutely. All right, uh, first about uh, some few things about product management at Magnolia. Um, last year, at last year's conference, there was no product management team and I was not at Magnolia. Uh, I've only been with the company for around seven months. Um, so we have that now and are doing a lot of things there. So there are five people um, in the team. So there's Andreas doing UX and working as the product owner in the Scrum Sense, and uh, Topher that you were just introduced to, Antti, uh, who spoke before, Nicola, and myself. So um, product management at Magnolia, just a few things. We're very, very heavily into design thinking and want to apply as many of those processes as possible. So it is all about doing a, a ton of research uh, in the early stages and getting to a prototype stage as quickly as possible to test out new ideas very quickly in front of, of real users. So uh, we are bombarded uh, with ideas of what to put into uh, the product and that is the nature of product management. So uh, to kind of handle all of those incoming ideas in a, in a structured way, we have a validation process that is quite thorough, where we have this uh, structured way of, of handling all those inputs uh, and a scoring model uh, to help us validate if the idea is good or not and should become uh, a candidate for the roadmap. So in, in essence, if you don't know uh, the field of product management, this is what we're doing here. So it is about discovering and validating new ideas. It is about defining the product to be built without, um, without specifying exactly how it should be built, but what it needs to do. And finally, it is to look across the entire lifetime uh, of the product and make sure that we keep it in a good state over a long period of time. So we also do a ton of customer research. Um, we try to spend as much time with customers and partners as possible. And I'm also going to end this talk today uh, with a very open welcome um, to uh, all of you uh, to get in touch with us. So um, I wanna go on and talk about what I call heavy lifting. This is uh, something that uh, Magnolia is already very good at. Um, but still, we're seeing a lot of things where we can improve uh, the product in regard to enterprise content management heavy lifting. 
So uh, what I'd like to do is to go through five trends um, that we are particularly observant of and want to discuss that with you. So as I said before, uh, product management or the nature of product management is to be bombarded with a ton of, of great ideas. And just want to uh, kind of expose the scale at which ideas come in. So on the left hand uh, side, <clears throat> we have people asking us, but what about virtual reality and content management? Uh, and of course, you could do a lot of interesting things there, I'm sure. Uh, it is an opportunity to innovate, <clears throat> as well as artificial intelligence, helping content authors uh, audit their content or even produce content, all those things, tons of great things that could be done there. Um, as many of you know, we've also uh, been digging into Internet of Things, uh, have been doing things about that for the past year. And then, as you progress to the right side, we get to the more uh, mundane feature requests, such as better copy-paste of content. So that's kind of the whole scale that we're working with. So what is key for us when defining product strategy is to find the right kind of spot where to, to focus uh, so, because we can't really go all the way to, to the left, and also we can't spend all of our time on the right. So, I'll go through five trends, and um, you're very welcome to come up with suggestions along the way, to, uh, right now, during the talk on Twitter with this hashtag, Influence Magnolia, and you're obviously also super welcome to come and, and talk afterwards. So, the five trends are, uh, first of all, the need to connect services. Number two is the surge of digital possibilities that is becoming simply too overwhelming for organizations to cope with. The third one is omnichannel, uh, not just being a trend, but be becoming mainstreamed. <clears throat> the fourth one is that uh, we look at relevance as something that is getting automated. And five, that uh, the time to market speed must outperform uh, the speed of obsolescence. So first, um, about connecting services. So uh, for me personally, when I joined uh, Magnolia, I was um, in lots of discussions, obviously, with uh, our CVO, Boris, for example. And I asked him usual questions such as, OK, where is Magnolia going? Uh, where will it be in five years? And what he's, he had, um, he said a lot of things about digital transformation to me. So I kind of had to internalize that and figure out what does that actually mean for the product reality? And <clears throat> uh, the fairly simple conclusion is that connecting uh, services, as we already do very well with Magnolia, is essentially operationalizing digital transformation. Um, so <clears throat> I kind of like this quote um, uh, by um, Parag Khanna. Uh, and he speaks of, this is about cities or mega cities, and he speaks of um, the need to realize that uh, the connectivity infrastructure is the most important thing to do for cities. And I believe that is exactly the same with software today. We need to focus on how to connect many, many different kinds of services. So um, if you aspire to transform into a digitally thinking organization, an operating organization, so those services have to be connected. And in fact, I think that uh, connecting services very well doesn't just bring the, the sum of, of, uh, of the value of each service, but it, it is a larger leap that you can make. You can look at many of the disruptive companies around the world and see how they are essentially just connecting a few services and coming up with a product based on that, which is much larger than just the individual services. Uh, so in my uh, kind of own journey into the Magnolia sphere, uh, I simply just discovered that for me there is no digital transformation or we cannot help organizations win there if we don't do this. So uh, while talking to our friends at Commerce Tools uh, some time ago, um, I asked uh, Martin Millman, who is uh, the product manager of Commerce Tools, how we're doing in this space. And I'm not going to read all of this to you, but what he's essentially saying is that we're actually quite good at that already, of being able to connect. So my question to you is, 
Uh, we may be quite good at integration already, uh, but how can we do better? So the, the second trend I'm going to talk about <clears throat> um, is the surge of digital possibilities. And I think, uh, while discussing this with customers around the world, that right now we are in this situation where there are always just a few, one, two, three people in organizations who really understand the complete setup of software being put together. So we have a few at Magnolia that can, that can actually understand the full scope. But um, as we progress and put more and more services together, that is simply becoming completely impossible for, for like one human brain to, to do. Um, so so what, it, what happens um, when it becomes too overwhelming is that organizations start to kind of put digital blinders on and they, they're, they're faced with massive complexity, uh, and then they sometimes simply end up choosing the simple path or the simple tool because it is too complex. They're obviously going to be, to be facing the complexity anyway, but they're kind of just saying, okay, let me just choose the simple tool, get on, I can understand what's going on. And um, figuring out how, um, to help organizations stay uh, empowered and not overpowered is key. And we have to figure out what the role of Magnolia is there. So what I'm saying is that it's not only our dear users who are sometimes overpowered or yourself by information overload, it is also really organizations becoming completely overpowered. And I think what, what happens when you're overpowered on an organizational scale is that you kind of cannot reach the full potential of digital transformation. So how do we help uh, organizations stay empowered? So one of the key aspects of how we are kind of working with that kind of thinking is the content apps, for example. So this is really about making sure that you as a user of the content management system or of Magnolia, that you are not completely overpowered. And also what is happening here, we're looking, um, we're looking into uh, an integrated uh, PIM here. What is actually happening here, apart from the niceness for the author, that is really operationalizing digital transformation. So um, I think, quite frankly, it is, <clears throat> it is quite easy to make a product more technologically advanced. You can always do that. It's, it is fairly easy. <clears throat> you just bring a lot of very technical people together, and what they do is that they come up with even more technologically advanced solutions. On the other hand, making it more humane is super difficult, and we're trying to do that. So one of the ways we're thinking about that is that if we could modularize, modularize the UX and UI <clears throat> um, of, uh, of the software even more, to, to put it together in more different ways, then we could kind of strengthen that unified UX that we are already quite good at. So again, the question here <clears throat> to you is, now we may be good, or some will say we're not, but I think we're quite good at simplifying what is super daunting, so, but how can we progress and, and become even better? So the third uh, trend I'm going to talk about is omnichannel, and not just omnichannel, but omnichannel becoming mainstream. So today or yesterday, we saw several talks uh, touching you know, upon the subject of omnichannel, and it is something you talk about at conferences. It's something new still. So there are great examples of organizations that are completely capable of delivering uh, great experiences in a coordinated, orchestrated way across touch points in a user journey. But there is so, uh, there's so much ahead of us in terms of actually mainstreaming that. And I think what will simply just happen is that we're going to stop talking about this in the next few years as it becomes more ubiquitous and something that is just expected that you are able to do. So again, we need to find the role of Magnolia here. And what we're definitely seeing is that you need to become more flexible in terms of the content sources and destinations. So we're not just speaking about content on a web page, but uh, content that can go anywhere in an orchestrated fashion. 
So what, uh, going back to the author experience uh, topic, I think that just because technology delivers omnichannel or that it enables omnichannel, it doesn't mean that humans are able to actually produce content that makes sense in a relevant way at each of those touch point experiences. <clears throat> so related to that is the whole uh, discussion about headless content management, obviously. Uh, because uh, if it's not headless, then you're dealing with the web page mostly. And uh, last week in Leipzig at a conference, uh, someone asked me this question, does the CMS still need its head? And I have to think a bit, a bit about that. It's a fairly tricky um, um, question, but I think it's the wrong question really. And instead I have a, uh, a question uh, that I think is better, but is also a bit more complicated. So should we separate the structured reusable content from the shorter lived on page content? used for curation of those reusable assets? And the answer is definitely yes, we can do a lot of things there with Magnolia in terms of making it easy to use content apps for structured reusable long-term content and site building capabilities of kind of curating all those assets from different places. Uh, so I think we need headless content authoring, definitely, and we um, luckily already have that and have had that for for a long time in Magnolia, and the content apps are, are really great for that. And then you need uh, an environment where you can curate the touch point experiences, whether it's web uh, page or something completely different like a smartwatch or whatever. Um, but what I'm saying is that there's value, um, there's great value in being able to kind of seamlessly connect those two worlds of headless content authoring and curation um, of the touch point experience. So you can kind of weave together what is reusable and what is short term stuff. And again, uh, content apps um, is something that we, we're really exploring. Uh, how can we make it easier for you to get uh, to, to use content apps? So um, I, w I was looking at uh, a book uh, by Wolfram Nagel the other day, who's speaking of this, and he's saying that a system of the future supports the examination, filtering, and moderation of content from a wide array of sources. So again, this is not just web page content. I also <clears throat> asked uh, industry analyst uh, Janus Boye uh, about so what is going on with the with this CMS space, what is next, and what he wrote was this: that as an as a reply to me, that if someone <clears throat> somebody built a CMS that actually performs these things, then that would be a game changer. Now, again, I'd like to ask you: uh, we may be very good at enabling omnichannel, but how can we do better? So you're very, very welcome to get in a conversation with us about that. And number four trend <clears throat> is about relevance. So I think that automated relevance and the promise of fewer op better options um, for the end user is something extremely important. And there are two main areas of that that I see happening at the moment. One is uh, content being pushed um, much more than it is being pulled. Um, and the other one is obviously personalization. So we've heard that story before. I don't know if some of you remember this Wired Magazine front cover. Anyone has seen this before? A few, yeah, all right. Okay, so the idea was that, it, I think it's back from 1997 or 98, they were saying, uh, you know, uh, pull content uh, through a browser is going, going away, we're going to push content to you in a personalized manner. Uh, 12 years later or 15 years later, nothing had quite happened about that. But now uh, we're seeing things like uh, Google Now that actually does that in a very intelligent fashion. So this is um, my own Google Now screen showing content from websites that, I, that I'm, uh, I'm using quite often. So it's pushing uh, new relevant content to me based on that. And I actually like that as a user. So personalization is finally happening. So thank God industry analysts are not let down um, by us because they have been promising this for five years or so that this will be huge. Uh, but what we have seen at Magnolia in the past year, or at least as long as I've been here, is that, okay, customers are definitely completely going into this direction. It's becoming real. 
Um, so a month ago at the San Francisco conference we, we held, uh, there was a guy who said this, and that really uh, kind of, that was very inspiring to me actually, and the main takeaway from the whole conference for me, that personalization is the glue between marketing and content management. So I thought that's very, very interesting. And I asked David Rowe, who uh, is behind the quote, to give us uh, a, qu a quick um, video um, on that. So here you go. Hi, this is David Rowe. I'm one of the partners of Authex, a firm in the United States focused on digital marketing implementations. We at Authex are very focused on Magnolia, most especially as it takes the leap into including native personalization capabilities as part of the platform. Personalization is key for us as we see the capability as the glue that ties all marketing operations together. For quite some time, organizations have looked at personalization as an extension of big data or some complex algorithm of content which can unlock the converter in every visitor's heart. For us, it's a bit simpler than that, and we find it's really that capability that many organizations need, the ability to carry a single customer journey from inbound campaign through web experience. You see, we don't need to rewrite the copy for every product to fit every potential persona, but showing the right product for a customer coming off a social or email advertisement is absolutely critical. And that's the power of Magnolia's personalization roadmap, being able to operationalize the marketing capabilities of a website and relate it dynamically to the context of inbound marketing. It's the key, and we could not be more excited. Thank you. So that was uh, David Rowe, our newest, uh, from Authex, our newest partner in, in the US. So I was speaking to someone at the party uh, last night who told me that, yeah, I'm not going to believe that component personalization will be there until I actually see it. So uh, it's been on the roadmap for quite some time, but we're actually developing it now and getting it into 5.5. So what is next uh, for personalization? And that is, again, my question to you, uh, because you can go in so many directions. There are no best practices established in the industry when it comes to personalization yet. Uh, and what we like to do from the product management side is to get in very close contact with you as customers and partners uh, to figure out what is the right path for a Magnolia. And finally, I want to talk about uh, time to market speed. So I think time to market speed, speed must outperform the speed of obsolescence. What I mean by that is that ideas and products and anything you can imagine being published becomes irrelevant quite quickly or obsolete quite quickly. And we've seen so many examples of our organizations trying to get something out to the market that is about a trend, but they're kind of um, being uh, passed uh, by, by uh, the speed as, at which um, things become obsolete. So what we're definitely seeing as a trend too is that there is a shortening lifespan of content and we need to find ways to deal with that. And um, we've been asking ourselves what is really blocking fast time to market? And there is a long, long list of things where uh, it has a relation to the software we are building. Um, when we're looking at it uh, through the lens of, of what is product reality for us. And I'm not going to go through all of these, and, um, but for example, um, the whole Magnolia story, uh, Magnolia Now story that you've heard about yesterday is very much about this. It is about delivering or enabling very, very fast time to market. So uh, what is software's role in shortening uh, time to market? That is, again, the question from product management to you that we'd love to get in touch with you about. So um, on that note, uh, I'm going to um, leave it to Topher, who is going to speak about light development. Thanks, Rasmus. So this goes to the next slide, I guess, yeah. Hello again. Um, so we know that Magnolia is an awesome uh, enterprise CMS that can handle the heavy lifting. And my question is, um, what does light development bring to the table? So, uh, but first, uh, what, is, what is light development at its most fundamental? What's it all about? Um, it's about helping developers uh, uh, do the most common tasks fast and easy. And on a typical uh, project, this is a lot of the, the front-end development work, uh, the bread and butter, templates, dialogues, etc. 
Um, it also is about uh, enabling front-end developers to uh, perform uh, complete uh, entire Magnolia projects uh, without needing Java development. Um, so that's a pretty big step. Um, but at the same time, it, it also uh, enables uh, front-end developers and the front-end development to happen in concert with the Java and back-end uh, development on more typical projects, the kinds of projects that you're working on, on now. Okay, but what is it, uh, can we get more concrete? What, what really, <laughs> how do we do that? What is light development all about uh, at, the, at, the very, at the very bottom? And it's about files in a directory. Now, I know that doesn't sound uh, that innovative, um, but I'll get back to that later and tell you why it is and, and uh, how it achieves these other benefits. But um, what would be, if I had to you know, distill the value that uh, light development brings into one word, uh, the, the word I would choose would be agility. So it's all about uh, getting what you need to get done uh, as, as fast as possible done. Uh, Rasmus highlighted the, um, how important uh, time to market uh, speed is, that it's mission critical. And uh, light development and the agility it brings enables you to, um, you know, enables you and your projects to keep up with all of the uh, design changes that are happening, all the technologies that are happening, and it enables you to uh, outcompete uh, your competitors and bring out new features first. So you've heard a lot about light development uh, yesterday. Today I'd like to share you uh, some views on light development uh, from my perspective as a product manager. So there's two topics that I wanted to address today. Uh, one of them is the market research uh, that we've been doing, and the other one is the idea of light development as a platform. So you've heard about how uh, in the product management team, we're putting a lot of emphasis on research and on validation. And uh, after we launched light development last year, we wanted to check in on <laughs> how it was actually doing. So we had some confidence. We had already done a lot of research to design light development uh, to begin with. But once it was launched, how was it actually working for our partners? Um, and also to find out what improvements people would like in it next. So uh, the first step was a blog post about half a year ago, kind of describing um, uh, what we were working on, what the next steps that were planned were, and a survey uh, to find out, um, to help us prioritize uh, what we want to work on next. Um, I'm happy to report that thanks to our development team, uh, four of these features are all, have already landed in the 5.4 series, and uh, several other of them will uh, be included in 5.5. Um, but the more significant and substantial part of the work uh, was a series of interviews uh, that I've conducted with nine partners uh, over the past three months. Uh, and I really want to thank uh, everybody who participated in that. It was uh, very helpful. Um, and of course, I'm still ready to talk. <laughs> it's, the interviews aren't over. I hope to talk with you later at the conference, and you can get in touch with me later as well. Um, anyways, I started off these interviews, I mean, of course I had a, a list of questions, but I think the most significant question, I just wanted to make it wide open and really hear without influencing the answers what was on uh, our partners' minds when it came to development. So uh, I just started it out like that. What problems are you having? And of course, uh, I was most interested in light development, but this also gave us other good input about other topics. Uh, that we're working on uh, gave us a push towards the component personalization, for example. Um, and this, this uh, also uh, resulted in some uh, uh, quantitative data, uh, very low sample size, but still uh, great to hear correlation uh, between the different partners on something that, um, you know, I wasn't putting any words in their mouths. We could see what they really needed uh, to, to take things to the next step. Um, but it was also uh, qualitative, and it was uh, just very important to hear uh, the experiences developers were having actually uh, using um, 
light development. And uh, after the interviews, I asked a few of the developers if they could record a video to describe their experience with light development. So first, um, some words uh, from Nico Salmanen, a uh, front-end developer from Houston. Hi, I'm Nico Salmanen from Houston. And we've been working on a project for about a year now where we build a new website for a large Finnish telecommunications company. And when we started the project, I was pretty worried about all the bootstrap XML files and configuration app stuff and all that, what was required for front-end development work, especially how we were going to manage all that with multiple developers. But luckily, when we started the project, Magnolia 5.4 came out and uh, promised a new cool feature called Light Modules, which was promised to speed up front-end development work and make it more streamlined and so we decided to try it out and see if it could help us. And basically all we had to do to add up light modules was add a new build task to our Go build system, which we were using for the static HTML prototype. And we now have four front-end guys working on the project and we have zero problems from concurrency. And changes are really easy to merge and we also are able to do code reviews where we can simply see all the changes that have been made since the last version. So all in all, I give Light Modules two thumbs up. Um, and now perspective from a back-end developer, uh, Jordi Diepeveen uh, from Trim in the Netherlands. A few weeks ago I gave uh, Magnolia training to our front-end and back-end developers. And most of the front-end developers did not have any experience with Magnolia yet. Uh, the goal of the training was to introduce light development and to transform a static prototype into a fully working Magnolia website. Um, and within a few hours our front-end developers uh, managed to fully transform uh, the static prototype into a fully working Magnolia website. For the last couple of months we're using Magnolia for also smaller websites and I really think that uh, light development can really speed up the process. Yeah, um, I'd like to share a few other uh, results, interesting results from the, the interviews. Um, I thought about uh, <laughs> that clip from Jordi. He talks about the advantage for, uh, especially, especially for small projects. And I thought about editing that out, like, no, it's not just for small projects, it's for big projects too. But I actually think it's nice because it demonstrates uh, just how fast you can be with Magnolia now that it, um, that it can also bring benefits for, for smaller projects. It shows how uh, the development process can scale. Um, yeah, so what we learned or what I learned, just a few things to take away. Um, well, probably almost most importantly is that um, uh, we're, we're crafting the specification for the next releases of Magnolia based on the input. And I'm very confident that the next releases that we deliver um, are going to further uh, improve your development experience with Magnolia. Um, some of the interesting things that came up from a few of the partners were um, the idea of, of really wanting to parallelize work. So being able to work uh, in con uh, in con uh, concurrently uh, on projects, of course, in order to make them even faster. And light development uh, addresses this by reducing the dependencies between front-end development and back-end development. Um, the front-end developers themselves don't need to wait for somebody else to add their files to a project. Uh, but there's also some other outside of light development uh, top uh, issues related to that. For example, another partner was mentioning they wanted to, even before the site was done, they wanted to be uh, creating the content for it and doing the translations for it. So I think there's uh, some interesting opportunities for um, further improvements there. Uh, another topic that came up uh, several times uh, that I'm very excited about, uh, I think it's a really cool innovation, um, and it's nice some partners are already doing it. Some, there's some presentations today about it. And for lack of a better term, I'm calling it universal templates. And this is the idea that uh, instead of having a handover between the front-end developers and the back-end developers, always having to update designs um, on, on the server, on the, for the server templates that have been done uh, in the front-end, is that you use one set so that you don't have any uh, time delay or uh, errors coming in because of that. Um, and then um, 
just some thoughts on front-end developers. Uh, I'm, I'm curious in the audience, uh, how many of you are already familiar with something called atomic web design or atomic design? Okay, cool. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, this was a really cool project. Uh, there's also going to be a, a talk, I think, right after this or soon. Um, and it basically show that along with uh, you know React and Angular, everybody's heard about these web components. Uh, Front-end developers, um, they are more sophisticated now. They're not just working on pages. Atomic web design is all about building things modularly instead of working on the page. So these two concepts of working in a modular way, of working with templates, uh, mean that uh, in my view, it doesn't work for every project, but front-end developers can own the templates. That can be their level of responsibility, and back-end developers can have writing Java code, um, uh, you know, writing, writing the, the, the templating functions or the models that can be used within the templates, but the templates can belong to the front-end developers. And the back-end developers that I discussed this with uh, were also happy uh, to be able to offload wrangling files um, uh, to the front-end developers, to their domain. Now, of course, this isn't appropriate for every project, but I just want to plant that seed. Um, but the most important result, I think you heard uh, from, from the interviews, and I, I really heard this again and again, um, also just at the conference uh, yesterday, it was uh, really great to hear from experiences of people using it. Um, it really works. Uh, the second, um, the second topic I wanted to discuss with you today is the idea of light development as a platform. So I know the word platform, it's a bit grandiose, but let me try to explain. Um, you're familiar with the open suite idea of Magnolia. It has great integration points via Java, via REST. Uh, you can really uh, take, take the best of everything. You can integrate tools to Magnolia. Um, with light development, there's a new uh, opportunity for doing integrations. And that is brought about by this files in a directory. And it's the idea that you can uh, integrate, not just with Magnolia, but with your projects, with your project files. So the, the key thing is that um, instead of the configuration being within Magnolia, uh, your configuration is now uh, in, in your file system along with your um, other files. And it means that Magnolia can be treated in the same way uh, that we, work, we already work with HTML, J JavaScript, CSS. There's already this huge ecosystem of tools and processes and knowledge about how to work uh, with these front-end resources, these files. And these can now apply to Magnolia configuration as well. Um, yeah, so what's an example of that? Uh, this sounds nice in, in, in uh, principle, but do we have examples? And I'm really happy to say that at this conference we have uh, at least four great examples of that idea. And before I discuss them in a little more detail, I just want to say um, it's amazing. I'm very Im impressed uh, that the Magnolia community has taken this up. We just launched it last year, and already people are innovating uh, on this technology. So I think you saw the, um, or I hope you saw the Magnolia CLI presentation uh, from uh, Thomas and Jan yesterday, where they, they showed how with just a few key command strokes, you can be uh, creating new templates, creating new components. Uh, today, um, Netcetera is going to be showing their hibiscus, which is about this universal templating, um, about uh, building a, a, a living style guide that's always in sync with your actual project. It doesn't get out of date because it's just the same templates used for the style guide and for the actual website. Um, uh, very nice. Another very nice implementation of universal templates uh, from Aperto with the native handlebars. That's going to be later today. And I uh, hope that you saw the code tools from Comerge, where it's an actual, uh, actual IDE integration that uh, gives you, you know, intelligent validation and autocomplete on Magnolia configuration. And this is all facilitated by uh, light development. Uh, one other thing I wanted to sh uh, seed, I kind of wanted to plant with, with you, is um, uh, what about inventing your own configuration? I mean, we know the Magnolia configuration is perfect as it is, right? You wouldn't want to change anything. Um, but if you did get some funny ideas, um, a, a very common uh, uh, technique with, with front-end tools is that of transformation. 
So um, with the web platform, of course, you, you need to run CSS files, but uh, you have these tools. You can use SAS, you can use LESS, you can use these other formats that give you much more power uh, in, how you're, in how you're working with those, and then you do a transformation uh, to, to change that SAS to uh, CSS files, which run on uh, the web platform. So with Magnolia, uh, now you can use those exact same processes, those, because we're talking about files, to create your own configuration if you want, and transform that into Magnolia configuration that runs on our light development platform. Um, what would be an example of that? Uh, well, you know how in a dialogue definition, um, you always need to supply the actions? Um, wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to supply those actions, or if you didn't, there would be some default ones? Uh, it would make the files a bit drier. So um, I've been exploring that idea. This isn't an official Magnolia uh, uh, product, but it is something available for you to, to try if you'd like. Uh, it's called Magnolia Lighter. It's on GitHub, um, and it's made to be hacked on. It's, uh, it's, at, it's basically a set of these transformation techniques. So you could use it to do anything. And out of the box, it comes with some things I was exploring uh, for how the regular Magnolia configuration could be lighter. Uh, so for example, um, you don't need to supply actions. If you don't supply them, they'll be brought in for you from a prototype. Um, or, for example, um, in your template definition, you don't need to supply the template script. You don't need to supply the, the, the ID of the dialogue. It will just use like a convention uh, over configuration approach, and if the files are in the right place, you can use them. You don't need to do the wiring yourself. And this, uh, this is basically running on Gulp, so the concept is that you can basically work on a set of source files that are your own configuration, and this watch process on Gulp uh, will make the Magnolia uh, light development platform files for you. Yeah, so uh, just to wrap up the light development um, part of the talk, uh, my call to action to you is try it. Try light development. And uh, also, if you have some uh, ideas, think about how you could um, uh, leverage the light development platform with your own tooling, how you could innovate on it. Um, but let's zoom back out to the theme of this talk. Uh, it's not just about, it's about how uh, the heavy lifting and light development come together. Uh, what about that question I asked? Uh, what does light development, what does it mean to, to, to add light development to the heavy lifting of Magnolia? What does it mean when you have one, mag one CMS that can do both. So there's a lot of talk about experience, uh, customer experience, digital experience. A, a key part of that, a way I like to look at it, is uh, we're building an interface. We're building an interface between an enterprise or a large organization and people. Those people might be members or customers or constituents. Um, but it's all about uh, building a relationship and an interface between the organization and the people. And I don't have to tell you uh, how fast uh, the, the web is changing. It feels like it's accelerating all of the touch points. Uh, and at the same time, there's this huge trend of um, companies bringing more and more of their interactions with their constituents online. So the need to keep up, the need to be agile is critical, and that is what, uh, that is what light development adds to the heavy lifting. Um, you have an agile enterprise interface. Now, when you have two things coming together, they each bring something to the other. So we've mostly been talking in this talk about how light development helps an enterprise go agile, but you can look at it from the other perspective as well. Um, Magnolia now, with light development, makes Magnolia accessible to agencies, to marketing departments that already have a, a strong front-end skill set. And with Magnolia 5.4 and 5.5, uh, they can take their game up a level and they can go enterprise. So, Rasmus? All right. 
Thanks, Topher. Um, I will just end with a few um, uh, notes on how to get in touch with us. Uh, because we mean this extremely sincerely that we're extending this open welcome to everyone who would like to get in touch with us to, 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 to talk and discuss uh, the trends that we're seeing and working on in our product strategy development and the more specific uh, things that we're working on from the product management side as well. So how to get in touch? Um, first of all, we do quite a few customer and partner visits, um, and uh, we're going to keep doing that. So we are very open to come visit you. And, and I kind of have a preference for doing that myself, because seeing how the reality of your uh, daily life is and how that works uh, while using our software is just really a, a gold mine for us when we're researching uh, and figuring out how to move on with uh, with the software in the future. So on the other hand, you're also extremely welcome to come visit us in one of our offices, and uh, you're really very welcome to knock on the door and, and come and say hi and talk to us on site. Apart from that, there's obviously our forums. You're also very welcome to simply just write directly to us. And uh, what I'd like to mention, too, is that we have a suggestion box. I don't know if you've all seen it, but we launched that, I don't know, about a half year ago or something like that. And um, you're very welcome to uh, give us suggestions via this uh, suggestion box that you can find online. So um, with that, uh, just uh, an, a very open welcome to all of you to kind of participate or co-participate in our design thinking approach here. And uh, a big thank you for listening.